All right, we want to uh, <clears throat> continue the series that we're doing here on what every <coughs> Seventh-day Adventist should know. And uh, it goes through this uh <coughs> series here of uh, talks that you've seen before. Just go through it quickly here. First, a group on general philosophy, which we are not discussing right at the present, but involves these topics. Is there a God? So I'm pretty sure original life is one. Some of those uh, strong evidences for <coughs> God, for design. And then more uh, dealing with the geology area and a question of time and specifics about the Bible. How old is life on Earth? Was there a flood? <coughs> and uh, we have dealt with the last three already and uh, with uh, widespread layers, excuse me, uh, rates of erosion and uplift, which we discussed last week. Uh, today we're getting to paraconformities and soft sediment deformation. And then also in the series we'll have uh, these talk talks here, uh, Coconut Sand, Yellowstone, Fossil Forest, Ice Cores, and Radiometric Dating and uh, Alan White. So, so we get to this uh, topic for today. And we have uh, <coughs> flat gaps and soft sediments challenge geodetic time. And to, to uh, emphasize that, number of references, this is put here strictly for reference for those who want to pull it off on the internet. We're not going to go through all these, but uh, it gives you somewhere where to find some more information uh, regarding this. We'll not spend much time on that, but uh, be aware there are a lot of references on this topic. <coughs> the issue is these layers. Dead Horse Point in Utah, looking down at the Colorado River, uh, supposedly, according to technical interpretation, you know, many hundreds of millions of years involved in these layers. Uh, if they were that old, then of course the biblical model of origins is false. God says directly, in the most direct words he gives us, that he created all in six days. And the Bible implies it was just a few thousand years ago. Uh, evolution says, of course, no, this, we had evolution over millions of years, and uh, that, that's the, the big issue in <coughs> this slide I showed you last week. Points out the, the, the point, you have your layers here, the geologic column, which is very important in what we're talking about today. Uh, <coughs> If you're Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, so on, Precambrian, uh, that is a, an important break there where you see the, uh, the red. Uh, that's where you have your Cambrian explosion and a major change in the fossil picture there. Evolution uh, suggests billions of years. When you get to the creation model at the right, we're talking about thousands of years. Extreme contrast here in time. And time is the big issue. It's the big challenge. And <clears throat> um, the scientific community overwhelmingly adopts the long ages. The Bible unquestionably challenges that or disagrees with it. And so we're, we're addressing that question right here. Now, uh, <coughs> GLICOM, I know many of you are not familiar with it, and so on, but just point out a few major parts of it that uh, we've been discussing, but most important to our discussion today is the right-hand column there. The putative age in millions of years. M-A means millions. A stands for annum. Uh, we're talking about millions of years. That's the terminology for <coughs> millions of years. 
and you notice uh, Cambrian is 540 million years, and you get younger and younger dates as you go up through the geodetic column. Uh, the picture we showed you, uh, two slides back at that horse point, covered part of the Paleozoic and part of the Mesozoic. If you look at the second column there, and there are the eras and so on. It depends on where you are as to which part of the geodetic column you're in. Uh, but in the Western United States, you have a fairly nice representation <coughs> of most of it in its major parts, not in all details at all. <coughs> well, uh, one of the points we want to discuss today is what we call flat gaps. Uh, and this is the question of uh, gaps in these layers. See, when you look at those layers, out there, you're totally unaware of the fact that parts of the geodetic column are missing in certain places. And that is where we find a challenge to geologic time, to radiometric dating, and to the long ages suggested by science. So, it, so it's keep in mind that we have parts of that geodetic column missing in certain areas. <coughs> And keep in mind what we mentioned to you last week, <coughs> that the average rate of erosion for the continents, the world is about 60 millimeters per 1,000 years, or roughly <coughs> 100 feet per million years. That's present rates of erosion. Uh, second figure there is corrected for the effects of agriculture, which would speed up erosion, hence present rates of erosion are too fast for what you'd expect in the past. And so you need to correct it, which would slow it down a little bit. But it only slows it down by a fa factor of about one half. So it's, it's not a major thing in terms of the tremendous differences in time we're talking about here in terms of millions versus thousands. <coughs> then. Uh, but point out th this rate corrected for uh, even slower because if you take out the agriculture, so on. <coughs> this is too fast to preserve our sort of topography, <coughs> and it's especially noticeable where major parts of the geodicom are missing. This is where we want to look at it here, because where it's missing, you should see the effects of that time. So the issue is parts are missing. Is there evidence of the amount of time that you'd expect where parts of those layers are missing because uh, the weather takes its toll on the geological surface of the Earth? Well, uh, you know erosion. And it's extremely, part extremely important for you to understand the next two slides here. Uh, <coughs> This is, this is uh, erosion. This Colorado River in northeastern Utah, you can see it right there. Erosion tends to be irregular. And uh, uh, you can see how irregular the river's got a deep channel there, and look how irregular the topography is. Now, here is an enigma. This is an enigma for those who believe in long ages. Because you don't see much erosion there at the end of that red arrow. And that surface, surface is dated according to radiometric dating, according to the fossils, to be about 160 million years old. And so the question arises, could that surface be 160 million years old considering how irregular erosion tends to be. Uh, there's a model for, for flat erosion. Uh, it's more of a parlor game than uh, uh, anything that you know about in nature. But uh, uh, this, this, the flatness of this area, and this is Kangaroo Island in Australia. It's uh, 145 kilometers long. Notice how flat the surface is. And it's flat for most of, that, most of the island. There's a little bump on the end. 
But the, so the, the question is, uh, how could that island sit there for 160 million years and be so flat when average rates of erosion would produce at least five kilometers of erosion in that amount of time? There's something radically wrong here. Uh, Tweedale, famous geomorphologist, <coughs> has commented on this. He says, uh, this is in the American Journal of Science, survival of these paleoforms, he's talking about Kangaroo Island, he's talking about other regions in uh, southeastern Australia. The survival of these paleoforms is in some degree an embarrassment to all the commonly accepted models of landscape development. What are you going to do when you have no changes for 160 million years? <coughs> well, uh, if you believe in the Bible, of course, this is no problem. The thing isn't 160 million years old. It's recent, and so uh, it's not an issue if you accept that particular model. But the scientific community is not open to that particular model at present. <coughs> well, uh, <coughs> so. What we've illustrated there, we're going to talk about within the geologic layers, not just Kangaroo Island there, that's flat. We're going to go into the geologic layers. We have these gaps, and these gaps are very flat, like Kangaroo Island, not like the Colorado River in, in Utah. Challenging the time, within the lay various layers of the geologic column. <coughs> and these gaps tend to be flat. Not all of them, but many of them are flat. And uh, the question can be raised, you know, uh, are they really as long as the part of the geologic column that is missing? Uh, <coughs> how do you tell you have a gap? Because somewhere else on the Earth, you've got the layers that, for that gap. And if those layers took 50 million years, they say, well, the gap is 50 million years old. There's 50 million years missing where you've had these gaps. Uh, <coughs> various names are given in the geologic literature to these gaps. Uh, paraconformity is probably the most precise one in a way, but it's Definite, these definitions, unfortunately, are not precise. Uh, disconformity, uh, there you have parallel layers. You may have a little bit of erosion. In paraconformity, you may have no erosion. You may have at least a line that you can see where the gap is. Uh, Non-sequence, term used in, uh, by British geologists especially, just tell you, hey, this is part of the sequence is missing here. They call it a non-sequence. On conformity, a broad term applies to all the uh, other terms above. It's sometimes used for, for these gaps, but it uh, is not <coughs> uh, a term per se what we were speaking about. It. Terminology is not precise, as I told you. Flat gaps, that's a kind of a colloquial term we use because it describes it so nicely. We're talking about gaps, and they're very flat probably fit the paraconformity uh, terminology more closely than others. Uh, but you want to see paraconformity? There's one. Uh, it's a picture of the Grand Canyon here. Uh, at the end of that red arrow, you see a whitish layer going across the whole canyon. Between that reddish, la that whitish layer and the reddish layer that's right below it, there's a gap. It's probably about a six million year gap. Uh, yet note how flat the bottom of that whitish layer is. And the question arises, could that reddish layer sit there for six million years and uh, not produce a gap? How do we know there's a gap there? Well. Uh, take you to about 100 miles south of Green Canyon. This is in uh, Sedona, Arizona. <coughs> Beautiful little town. 
and you've got some layers there. You've got the top layer, you see it's kind of tan, named the coquinino. Then you got a orange, pale orange layer there called the Schnebly Hill. That's another formation. And then below it you see a dark red layer called the Hermit. Now, this is Sedona. You go back to the Grand Canyon, you got the Coconino on top, you got the Hermit below it, but there is no Schnebly Hill. Schnebly Hill is supposed to have taken uh, five million years and there's a gap, but there's are six million years. Uh, some say 10 million, but anyway, we can stick by a conservative figure. Uh, six million years. So that six million years between that Hermit and the Cooking Hill, while that Schnebly Hill layer was being deposited in Sedona. Question, is that the Hermit Shale? What's that? Is that the Hermit Shale? Yeah, did I? Yeah. So it's uh, relatively soft material. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. Very easily eroded. Uh, so, and this is a diagram, again, repeating it to make sure you get this point, because this is what uh, everything rests upon, more or less on this. Is <coughs> uh, it's a picture of a gap here. The red line is the gap. Above it is the overlayer over the gap, you see. The problem with these gaps is, you know, there's nothing there. It's like the hole in the donut. You, 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 nothing there to, to describe it. Uh, then you got an under layer and so on. And the way you tell the amount of time in the gap is because, as we say to the right there, you have that brownish layer, which you could call the Schnebly Hill, maybe if you want to. Uh, how long did it take for that layer to be laid down? Uh, and the length of that time is the amount of time that the red line area would be exposed. And if it was exposed, you expect a lot of irregular erosion. You don't see it there. Yes? Just a minute. Yeah. <coughs> So if the um, if the if this is being deposited by let, let's say at the bottom of a basin, <coughs> you know some sort of <coughs> Gulf of Mexico type basin, yeah. um, in which there was nothing lower than that, it's at the bo it's the bottom right, of the basin. Usually, right. Then would we expect any erosion to to make <coughs> that flat basin irregular if it has nowhere to pour off from? No, or two. in the basin you just have deposition. You're just laying down. There is no erosion in that part of the basin. Let's put it at least that way. So could that the other part is usually considered to be eroded area. It's not a depositional basin. It is an exposed area. Exposed to air. To air, the weather. Uh, you know, it, if it isn't deposition. A deposition, it's erosional. There's no place on the surface of the earth over the million years that you neither have deposition or erosion. If you don't have deposition, you have erosion. At the bottom of the sea, it's still depositing ooze. Sure. But you have no gap there. As long as it's depositing, you have no gap. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. These two different areas. The where you have deposition you don't have a gap, or you don't have depos deposition, you should have erosion, and it should not be flat. Green line there shows you what you'd expect. While the brownish layer to the right there is being laid down, if you didn't have any deposition here, you'd expect erosion. You can't suspend the weather for millions of years any place on the earth. Uh, let's go over it once more here. Different picture entirely, but I think it <coughs> illustrates what we're talking about. Supposing we lay down layers, and you have the 
layers are usually laid down horizontally in flat pattern. Then you, that depositional area is uplifted. It's no longer a basin. So you have erosion. And so you're going to have what we call an erosional unconformity. <coughs> It'll be usually irregular. <coughs> then you have sediment being laid down over that. And you're going to be able to pick up that old erosional unconformity, which is illustrated by the white line in the third uh, stage here. What we usually see is what we have in the fourth diagram. We don't see the pronounced erosional unconformity we would expect if that area had been exposed to erosion over the long period of time where you have the gaps. Now, uh, and finally, let me show you this. This story tells it all. <coughs> so pay special attention to it. <coughs> we have, this is kind of like a, a map uh, illustrating time. And you have uh, time scale in your second column there, and they're aged 600 million years, uh, sorry, 500 million years there. Uh, near the bottom and 400, 300, and so on. Those are all millions of years according to the standard geological time scale. So you've got <coughs> various layers, but in some, at times layers are not laid down. And they are illustrated in black. And so uh, when you have a wide black layer, that's a big gap when you have a <coughs> smaller one, so on is shorter. And these are various uh, formations. This is a region uh, northeast of the Grand Canyon, represents about 133 kilometers across and about three and a half kilometers of layers, which are the white material. Now keep in mind, the white material sits on top you know, of itself. You know. You don't, have, you don't see the gaps, but this is put on time scale. And so where are there parts of the geologic column missing, it's in black. And where uh, the uh, geologic layers lie and so on, various IDs, uh, parts are laid down. The red wall, for instance, there. Uh, we talked about the Coconino. Uh, you see it up there to the left, that red arrow, <coughs> and so on. Uh, is there, and so on. This is that region, and you, you can see how flat these layers are one on top of another. We'll be talking about that a little bit more in two weeks. Uh, but uh, notice the present topography imposed on this diagram in terms of the dashed line or the solid line of the green or the red arrow. Notice how irregular present topography is compared to the fossil topography. Notice how flat the layers are compared to the present surface of the Earth. Take your pick, either one of those. Uh, the dashed line happens to be right along Interstate 70, which is probably the flattest line you could find in that region. That's where they put their interstates. And the, the red, of course, is where it's much more accentuated, <coughs> a little further to the south, where they didn't put the interstate. Uh, so, you know, uh, the contrast between present topography and these flat layers is striking evidence of how different the past was from the present. If you've got a gap here of 140 million years, <coughs> uh, that big uh, black line, the thick line there the near the bottom, you'd expect all kinds of erosion in, in this uh, <coughs> Moave. Uh, that's, that's in the Grand Canyon. <coughs> Excuse me. And so on. Uh, and so on throughout there. But these things lie quite flat on top of each other. 
in, compar in comparison to the present topography, which is highly irregular. I mean, this is a, a closed case that the past is not the key to the present. There's been something very different in the past. And it looks like, you know, there wasn't that much time for erosion at these gaps. And it looks like, it, you know, maybe the GI column was laid in quite rapidly. So uh, this tells you really the, the whole story of this, at least for that particular region. So let, let's move on quickly here. <coughs> uh, there are two gaps here in, the, in this uh, set of layers. This is uh, Paleozoic Mesozoic layers here. <coughs> and one of them is 10 million years. And in 10 million years, you'd expect maybe 1,000 feet of erosion. Uh, this whole valley here is about 2,000 feet deep. So. And uh, you'd expect you know, some very irregular thing. If really 10 million years of layers is missing there. Where is that 10 million year gap? Right there. See that line? And you can follow it all, all the way across. It's, it's the Chenard conglomerate. Uh, and you can find it all, all across through here. You know, it's very flat. 10 million, 10 million years? Uh, that doesn't seem quite right. Uh, that, there's another one, 20 million years. In 20 million years, you'd expect 2,000 feet of erosion, which is top to bottom in that, in that cliff there. Uh, no, it's again very flat, right there. That whitish layer, you can follow it all the way through here, if I can get this air to work. Follow it all the way through here, and it's continuation right here. This layer continues through here. It's called the White Rim Sandstone. Uh, very famous gap, much more widespread in this area. Uh, and very flat. It looks like things were laid down rapidly, as you'd expect during the flood. Uh, to point out those two gaps <coughs> right there, here is the uh, Chin Li. The Chin Arab is right at the bottom of the Chin Li, right there. Uh, the 20 million year gap is this line right through here, this gap right there. Look how flat the layers are. Contrast that to the present surface of the Earth. You've got a real challenge to the long geologic ages. Okay, we need to move rapidly along here. Uh, <coughs> here is that same 10 million year gap. This is 200 miles south of the last locality we showed you, and uh, it's still there. Uh, right below that cap rock you see in those cliffs there. And uh, again, very flat. Go to Monument Valley. Uh, same two gaps are there in the monuments. Here's the 10 million year gap right there, cap rock. 10 million years right below that. Uh, then below that is the, the other one, uh, below the Mount Kofi. Uh, and it's right across there. No, notice how flat those things are. And you can follow them through all those monuments. Of course, uh, part of it was eroded out by some great washout, which we like to think of as uh, maybe the receding waters of the Genesis flood. Well, um, this is near, two, near Tucumcari, New Mexico, uh, right below the Ogallala. 200 million year gap. You jump from Triassic to Pliocene. Uh, it's a major gap, you understand? <laughs> uh, right here. Uh, Look at your, you can see right here, uh, uh, the reddish layers below there are Triassic, and the, the layer above the arrow is Pleistocene. All this is missing uh, through there. Uh, yeah, so it's very flat. Um, view from Bryce Canyon, nine million years at, at the bottom of those uh, whitish cliffs there on top of the Great Cliffs. The Great Cliffs are very soft. Uh, New Mexico, uh, 20 million years there. So no sign of weathering, a fresh cut there, you know, right? Uh, 20 million years, it doesn't look like 
weather for 20 million years. Owl Creek Mountains in Wyoming, uh, 25 million years, 26 million years at the end of that arrow. Uh, this is uh, Cambrian, the uh, Ordovician Bighorn Dolomite. The stuff down here is Cambrian. Uh, and then you have uh, the Mississippi Red Wall, excuse me, Madison. It corresponds to the Red Wall, but it's, it's called Madison here. Uh, above it, and you can follow that line through there, uh, how flat it is right above this massive uh, big horn dolomite here. And so uh, you have the same picture here. Did, did, did that time really occur? Did the, get back to the Grand Canyon. We, we already talked about the six millimeter gap here, but we got some others in the Grand Canyon. Uh, right in that arrow there, we got a 14 millimeter gap. 14 millimeter gap, you'd expect maybe 1,400 feet of erosion. Uh, no, it's a very flat layer that you can follow through the whole Grand Canyon. And then down here, you've got a 100 million year gap. And uh, right below the red wall, uh, there is the uh, Hermit Shale, excuse me, uh, it's uh, the, uh, well, I tell you, uh, word. limestone? Uh, well, it'll come to me in a minute. The folks don't know it anyway, so I guess it doesn't matter that much. Uh, <laughs> there's another way there, uh, I, I've got to think of it. It's, uh, uh, right above the uh, Moav, uh, Temple Butte. Temple Butte. Uh, right below the Temple Butte, 100 million years missing uh, in the Grand Canyon. There is no Ordovician or Silurian in the Grand Canyon. Uh, I don't know where that is on the scale. It's these two parts down here. The, the Devonian Temple Butte sits right on top of the uh, Cambrian Moav. Uh, and and par part of the Cambrian's missing, part of the Devonian's missing, and so on. You got a 100 million year gap there. Uh, what do some of the geologists say about this? Well, uh, Blakey, this is in the classic on the Grand Canyon geology. Uh, the new edition of it says exactly the same thing in the new edition. Uh, Blakey says, contrary to the implications of McKee's work, location boundary between the Manakacha and the West Gogami formation. Remember what I pointed out, 14 million years? Uh, those are the formations there. Um, <coughs> for, it can be difficult to determine both from a distance and from, I mean, 14 million year gap. You, you have trouble finding this. What does it tell you? It doesn't look like things sat there for 14 million years producing erosion. Views from the same book, he says, referring to some localities over the very long lower gaps <coughs> so here the unconformity, the gap, paraconformity, even though representing more than 100 million years, may be difficult to locate. Can't even find these things. Uh, uh, did 100 million years take place there? Um, or if it's in Silurian plus miss, missing it there. Well, uh, that was one place in the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is a big place. Uh, we showed you a picture in the eastern Grand Canyon. This is in the western Grand Canyon. And you, you look there at these layers, and uh, this is a little further down in the canyon from the other picture. Your Kaibabs clear on top there, Coconinas up there, that whitish layer near the top and so on, and your reddish layers below. And you get a little further down into the more limestone layers down below. But right at the end of that red arrow, you look across there, you can kind of see a lighter whitish layer all the way across, right at the top of that whitish layer, just below the multiple thinner layers above it, is that 100 million year gap. It's there also. And these thin layers are there. It continues, 100 million year gap, no erosion. You have to have a flat area to lay down a flat layer on top of it. Uh, 
now the Western Grand Canyon again. Uh, and this is 100 miles west of that other picture, uh, not, not this one that I, uh, the, one, the first picture, well, the first and second picture of the Grand Canyon I show you, not the third, which is last. But right at the end of that radar, you can see prime more or less that whitish layer across. It's called the Grand Wash Dolomite. It's part of the uh, Moab limestone. And, uh, well, I suppose I can point it out to you right across, make sure you can see it. Right across here, right at the bottom of that cliff, right there, that thin layer there of Temple Butte. Uh, and so on right here, follow right across there, and so on. 100 million years, I was, uh, yes, 100 million years supposedly be there. And that remained flat there, nothing happening for 100 million years. Well, uh, Texas, 200 million years here. Uh, we, we have to move rapidly. Time is catching up with us here. Uh, 16 million years there. Palo Duro Canyon, uh, that 200 million year gap up there is 100 miles away from the 200 million year gap I showed you in the Tucumcari, uh, New Mexico. Uh, Petrified Forest National Park, uh, right at the top of the reddish layers right there, 190 million years. Not always that flat, but uh, there's an awful soft layer below it. Uh, very easy to erode away. Uh, near Vernal, Utah, a 20 million year gap on top of the Morrison Formation. Uh, right, that whitish line there. Uh, you got the Dakota sandstone is the whitish, those whitish layers you see up there. We've been talking about it. This is the Dakota here. Uh, you go 350 miles south of here, you got the same gap, but it's bigger there. It's 40 million years instead of 20 million years. Why? Uh, because uh, there's no Cedar Mountain formation there. There, here, the uh, the Cold Sandstone sits right on the Morrison directly, uh, and so you have a, a bigger gap there. Uh, you can follow this thing for. 100 miles very easily. Just drive from uh, the Arizona state border along Interstate 40 to, to Albuquerque, New Mexico. It just shows up there all the way along. Uh, these are not local situations we're talking about. And not just the United States. Or this is in Switzerland. 45 million gap there in the, in the Alps. Uh, uh, it's a dark layer you can see across there. Uh, New Zealand, four million year gap here. This is called the Marshall Paraconformity. Uh, it's spread over, uh, goes into Australia, uh, the Australian basin and so on, so it's not limited to New Zealand. Uh, Australia, a six million year gap on top of a layer of coal. How could coal sit there for six million years? It'd be that well preserved. This is a gap that's spread throughout the whole Sydney Basin, not just here. Uh, six million years. Uh, in South America, this is in Brazil. Uh, there is Triassic here, the darker layer below is Triassic. Layers above there are Jurassic. I'm sorry. Darker layers below are Permian. The lighter layer above is Jurassic. There is no Triassic here. 45 million years here. Uh, doesn't look like very much weathering over 45 million years. Uh, Van Andel comments on this uh, situation here. This is in uh, Venezuela. Uh, he says, I was much interfered early in my career by the recognition that two thin coal seams in Venezuela, dated by the fossils, uh, Separated by a foot of gray clay and deposited in a coastal swamp, he is assuming long ages model, you understand, were respectively of lower Paleocene and Upper Eocene age. The outcrops were excellent, but even the closest inspection failed to turn up the precise position of that 15 million year gap. 15 million years and you can't find it. Well, uh, questions? Uh, that come up. 
uh, about this. Uh, could these just represent widespread flat deposition of air of the earth? No. Uh, if you have deposition, you don't have a gap. If you have a gap, you should have erosion. If it's flat, it means it was deposited rapidly. That's the conclusion of our whole uh, sequence here. Could these be areas where there is no erosion or deposition? Uh, there's no such place on the earth that I know of, uh, of any uh, you know, significant area. You have to suspend weather. Can we have flat erosion? You occasionally have flat erosion on top of a very hard layer. Many of these layers are soft and certainly don't answer the question. Could erosion rates have been slower in the past? Yes, they could have possibly, but the fossil record suggests probably faster. The rainfall is probably more rapid in the past. It's not a solution. Uh, could these gaps have been protected by overlying layers? So you pile up layers on top and then erode them down. How are you going to erode them down so they'd be flat, especially when you have so many soft layers? That's not going to work. Uh, does thinning out at the edges of layers indicate a lot of time? I put that in there simply. This is an, uh, an excuse sometimes put on the uh, internet. Uh, these things thin out. I don't know what the reasoning is. Jones just came to me and just told me, hey, uh, these things are thin out at the edges. I told him, I don't care what they do at the edges. You got 100,000 square miles here and no erosion for 10, 20, 30 million years. You got to explain to me the major part of this thing. I don't care what happens at the edge. And he didn't, have, he had nothing else to say. Uh, <clears throat> is there evidence of weathering over time at these gaps? Usually not. The geography, uh, Newell says it doesn't look like they're weathered. Uh, but he, uh, this is a, in the, in the uh, peer reviewed literature standard geological interpretation. Uh, occasionally some weathering is reported. Phosphate at uh, that Marshall Park in New Zealand is reported there. But then others say, oh, you know, that phosphate came in there afterwards. It was transported after that. That is not due to weathering at that gap. So, it, you know, there are many different interpretations. Is there no evidence of erosion at the gaps? Yes, there is. Occasionally you find erosion at these gaps. They're very small compared to, you find like, some channels that are 100 feet deep in the Grand Canyon. Uh, into the uh, Temple Butte. Oh. But man, you, Grand Canyon, in a hundred million years, you'd expect at least 10,000 feet of erosion. And according to That's average deeper rates than of the erosion. canyon. What's that? That's deeper than the canyon itself. It's twice as deep as the canyon. Twice as deep as the canyon. So I, uh, if the gaps were underwater, would this not protect them? No, not at all. Uh, we have a canyon just as wide and deep as the Grand Canyon, just off the coast of California, uh, on the continental shelf there, the Monterey Canyon, the submarine canyon, and so on. You, uh, underwater erosion is uh, a well-established phenomenon. Well, uh, Bergen Formings challenge the long geologic time scale and so on. It's usually got evidence of the inner layer for the long ages, possibly for the gaps, especially like if your own suggests that the long geologic ages never occurred. Um, Paragon formings are not a case of local evidence. They are a worldwide phenomenon. This is important, folks. You find this over the world. Not, we're not talking about local uh, formation here or there, some phenomenon in it. This is worldwide. Periformies are what you'd expect from the astonishing Genesis flood, where you didn't have the time. Things were laid down rapidly during the Genesis flood. Well, uh, related to this is the uh, evidence for, for soft uh, uh, sedimentation. Uh, interesting things you find in the fossil record that uh, fit quite nicely with the idea, hey, these things were soft before uh, for a long t time, over a geologic time, if you think gee, that's possible, but uh, that is not possible in most cases. So it's, it's further evidence that, hey, 
things happen rapidly because they remain soft. And you can't think of them remaining soft all that long. Uh, for instance, right here uh, is an Arches National Park. You just look at that whitish layer in the middle there. You notice how it dips down into the reddish layer below uh, in several places. Obviously, the reddish layer below is soft. That's what we're talking about here in terms of the soft sediments. Uh, uh, but here it gets a little more interesting because this is uh, between that Mon Kofi and Shinar we talked about earlier. And this is, uh, you know, the Mon Kofi is supposed to be 10 million years older than the Shinar. And what's it doing acting as a soft? The, the Mon Kofi is the red part, the, the, the red rocks there. What's it doing acting as a soft layer after 10 million years before the Shinar on top was laid down? Uh, this is more acute yet, same situation exactly, Shinar, Mon Kopi. <coughs> the top 10 layer and the more coarse uh, layer below, these are uh, the Shinar conglomerate. Evidently, uh, notice how coarse this is, how to get spread for 100,000 square miles. Talk about catastrophism. Uh, but, but the red layer is Mon Kopi. Obviously, it had to be soft. But Mon Kopi is supposed to be 10 million years older than the Shinar. Uh, do an experiment. Go in the laboratory. Uh, three stages here, A, B, C. A, you take some mud and you overlay it with sand. Sand has a greater density than the mud. Uh, nothing may happen. But then you shake, shake the, uh, if you have it in the tank or whatever, you shake it a little bit, and the sand starts falling down into the mud. And uh, it produces what we call pillows. And below, so you see you've done more shaking, you get more pillows. Well, when you look at something like this in the fossil record, you, you see a sandstone layer above, see the mm, kind of mud below it, the grayish gray stuff, and then the brown, you see the pillows. Obviously, this stuff had to be soft. Both had to be soft when this happened. There's not a major gap between these two here. Uh, the one I showed you two slides back, it was. But come here. This is again back to that same 10 million year gap between the Mon Kopi and the Shinara. Uh This is in uh, <coughs> Capitol Reef. And you, you go down there along this little creek here, and you, you look in the cliff to the right there. Uh, th this is Shinara right here. Excuse me. This is Shinar right here, and this is Mon Kopi right below it. You need to look along here, you get right to the contact between the two. And you look here, here's your Shinar. Here's your Mon Kopi. And then you got some Shinar below it. Notice the color, uh, match. This is a sandstone. Uh, this is more of a shale, uh, finer material. And then below it, you got more Mon Kopi and so on. Green arrows are Mon Kopi, the red arrows are Shinar. The Shinar is supposed to be 10 million years younger than the Mon Kopi. Obviously, it had to be soft. Uh, go to Kodachrome Basin in uh, Utah, below Bryce, and you find the, these, these structures like this, these pipes. Uh, they call them pipes and so on. They, they stick out, and you... Uh, Here's another one right here. See it sticking up through here. Where do they come from? Well, so, somebody said, you know, well, maybe these are hot springs so on. Uh, we've studied these. Uh, they, you analyze the minerals in these things. They come from below, from layers below. This is another example here, another pipe. 
Notice the striations along it, vertical striations. Obviously, vertical motion. And then, very intriguing in the same area. You look at things like this, and you, you see all these reddish layers up here, and over here. And then you see, hey, something happened here. Everything kind of collapsed down here, down into this. What's going on here? Uh, you're not going to have this unless things are soft. Now, the explanation we are proposing, and Dwight Hornbacher uh, did his master's thesis here on this. Uh, uh, <coughs> here at Loma Linda on this thing. And this is, this is uh, explains to you what, what is involved here in this. Uh, looks like stuff was soft there. The whole thing was soft. There was an earthquake. Some of the heavy material pushed down. Other places, some of it pushed up. And you've got the uh, lithological identification that they pushed up. And so you have the various layers illustrated here, Carmel, uh, and try to layer here and so on. Uh, but these are the various pipes that you find in those rocks. And some of them stick up like that, and we show you pictures of those. Well, uh, they had to be soft. How long would it have to be soft? Well, the, the average, you know, it varies. They, they start up at different levels and so on. Uh, the average uh, Carmel, average in Trata, uh vary about 13 million years. Carmel had to remain soft, you can say, for 13 million years in order uh, to be able to penetrate into the, uh, to the entrada above it. There's one little interesting hint, and in, uh, it's this player Pleistocene thing. You have some conglomerates like this sitting here, and you have some of it invo involved in one of the pipes. And so it looks like this pipe did not form until this was present. Now, you're talking here not about 13 million years. We're talking about Jurassic uh, to, to Pliocene, uh, probably uh, 150 million years instead of uh, 13 million. Uh, if uh, this is a key to that, and it looks like it is, type of thing. Anyway, it looks like there's a lot of soft material out there to form these pipes. Uh, lastly, I'll go to the front range of Colorado. You look at the layers here. This is, uh, using the arrow here, this red is, this is all Precambrian granite. This is Sawatch sandstone, this whitish layer lying right on top of that granite and follow all the way through here. Above it is the reddish fountain formation. Uh, this is Cambrian. Fountain formation is Pennsylvanian, Permian, uh, about 250 million years later than this layer right here. Oh, sorry. Uh, if I can get find my arrow, and then this layer right here. About 250 million years there. Well, uh, you look at some of the granite now, and you've got part of the fountain formation in the granite. How did it get in there? Well, it's in cracks. You don't feel cracks unless you're soft. Uh, this is a big dike there, the granite on one side, granite on the other. This is a big dike there. That, uh, I think uh, that Paul, Paul remembers taking pictures of this. <laughs> Uh, and you look in the granite, and man, here's some of that so much sandstone filling these cracks right here. Look at it, all over the place. That so much must have been soup to fill those cracks. Well, the question is, when did the cracks form? Well, you, this explains it all. Uh, figure above is the picture of original deposition. You've got the Precambrian granite 
if you can see my arrow here. I can't find it yet, but here it is. Uh, you got the precarium granite here. You got that Sawatch sandstone here. Uh, you got that fountain formation here. Uh, sometime in the uplift of the Rockies, and this is usually supposedly occurred 70 million years ago, uh, near Laramide orogeny, uh, the granite cracked and the Sawatch uh, filled in the cracks like you see here. This is all that's left. Everything else has been wiped out uh, in, in this particular part of the diagram here, uh, or of, the, of the situation. But interestingly, what you find here, you see these reddish things right here and there? What are they? They are this fountain formation. How to get into those cracks in the Precambrian rock if they didn't exist when the crack occurred. So you got at least 250 million years here uh, that these layers had to uh, remain soft uh, in order for this material to be incorporated into this material here. And if it's laramide, uh, uplift of the Rockies, we're talking about 400 million years. Well, uh, maybe things went on more rapidly. Uh, and if they were all soft and so on and so on, you get some of this fountain into this, the latter stages of the flood. Uh, you don't have the time problem of things remaining soft that long. And especially, uh, this fountain should, should have I mean, this is limestone above it, and that lime makes a very good cement. And over the millions of years, now it certainly sort of cemented that fountain formation. Well, uh, significance of these sediments tend to consolidate quite rapidly over time, especially when under pressure. And we're not getting into those details right now. Uh, carbonates, there are rare exceptions, uh, but sediments that would have to remain soft over a soon very long geologic challenge the long geologic time scale because you very well are the fact that most rocks you go see in the mountains they're hard they're not fluid uh, looks like things happen rapidly so in concluding just let me give you this favorite quotation from Ellen White about this it says God never asks us to believe by giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith his existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. You don't have to turn your brain off to believe the Bible. And this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. We all have freedom of choice. And aren't we glad for that? Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. You're going to be... You're going to be bowled over. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, and we're aware of that, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence upon which to base their faith. And I suggest to you that these pair conformities, uh, no, no uh, erosion or little erosion at the gaps, and uh, the soft sediment and so on, they are part of this evidence on which we can rest our faith in. Final conclusion, you can trust the Bible. All right, any questions? We have. I, I guess the thing that appeals to me the most is, here you have sediments that have remained soft for six million, 10 million years, whatever, <laughs> and yet they're not eroded and they're not deposited upon. They've just kind of frozen in time. It just, uh, periconformities are hard enough to believe by themselves, but periconformities on soft sediments just uh, is, a, is a bridge too far. Uh, let me just interrupt. I, you want to make an announcement, don't you? Tell the class about next week. I came to listen to you. <laughs> no, we want to hear about next week. Oh, all right. <laughs> and, and then we'll come back to the questions. Uh, give me this chance just to, to tell you about our visitor for next week here. 
Dr. John Baumgardner uh, is an exceptional scientist, and he's going to be giving us a lecture this coming a week from today at the same time, same place. And then again, two weeks after that. So it's the 12th of April and then the 26th. What does he do and who is he? The announcement is in the church bulletin if you ever got one of those. But if you didn't, uh, it tells you that he has uh, a PhD from UCLA in physics. And for 20 years, he was a, a physicist at Los Alamos National Laboratories. And he himself worked with supercomputers there and developed software which has been used around the world uh, for modeling what happens to the Earth, which is, as you well know, is, is just a huge sphere surrounded by a thin shell that we call the Earth's crust, a few miles deep. And if it's disturbed by a, an asteroidal impact or whatever, uh, it is Baumgartner's software that has enabled the scientists to predict how the planet Earth would respond. Anyway, Baumgartner is a man of God, he's a Christian, and he has used this software, which is unique, uh, to, to come up with a model for what might have happened at the time of the flood. After all, he's wanting to, to make the whole flood story in the book of Genesis uh, conform to what we observe today and, um, and to propose, which he started doing this maybe 15 years ago, propose a sequence of events that could have ended up with the physical shape on Earth's surface that we see today. So uh, this is what he's discussing one week from now. And two weeks after that, He's going to be doing something else which will, I think, be very challenging because it's all very well to propose huge earthquakes when, as Genesis says, the fountains of the great deep were opened up. What does that mean? <coughs> uh, what we see in geology and what <coughs> Dr. Roth has been talking about with all this sedimentation the question that nobody seems to be asking is, where did all that sediment come from? <coughs> where did the sediment come from? Because sedimentary layers are even in the Grand Canyon. <coughs> I have hiked, maybe some of you have hiked, from the bottom, at, right down at Phantom Ranch, <coughs> 5,000 feet or almost that, up to the South Rim. That's quite an interesting hike, Vince. And in the process you pass one sedimentary layer the Redwall Limestone, which is eight or nine hundred feet from bottom to top. That's a lot of sediment. Do you understand? And when, when <coughs> they have ex uh, studied, that, e that <coughs> li uh, sedimentary layer extends for thousands of square miles. We're talking about multiple thousands of cubic miles of sediment. Where did that come from? So the, the physical realities <coughs> we see on the play on the surface of Earth today require an explanation that somehow we can fit into the Bible story. Baumgartner will be trying to answer that question, what, two weeks from now, three weeks from now. Anyway, that's enough. Next week. Hmm? No, He's starting next week with yeah. his first lecture, and but then two weeks after three that, weeks. his second thing, from now. Three how weeks. to deal with all the sediment yeah. you've been talking yeah. about. Thank you. Okay. Now, comments, questions. This mean you, no one understood, everybody understood. <laughs> yeah, the gaps are, gaps are real, they're not imaginary. I think you've demonstrated that. Um, I'll have two questions. The first is a why question. Why don't uh, old age, ancient earth geologists even talk about it? And if they do, <coughs> what's, their, what's their solution? Second uh, point is maybe a comment, see if you've uh, looked into that. In the state of Pennsylvania, they've drilled um, 
well drillings all over the state, mostly by mining companies, not just looking for oil or water, but coal. finding where, at what level the coal is. And then they <coughs> map out the contour of the various coal beds and what's below and what's above. And they've found what they think is a dendritic river pattern that's mm -hmm. sandwiched between several layers of sediment and coal. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any <coughs> creationists discuss that. Maybe you've looked at yeah. it. Maybe you can comment on that. So I have two questions. Yeah, to answer your second question first. Uh, Good. During a flood, I'd expect all kinds of dendritic patterns, water moving around. Uh, I have no problem with that. I mean, I, I know you're right that creationists don't address that very much. Man, when you got uplifting uh, subsidence and so on, uh, you're going to have water shifting around. The water tends to form channels, part of the flood. Along with that, do we have other places in the column that you've seen dendritic um, drainage patterns? We would expect if it's in one place, it uh, would be everywhere. Oh, they, they, they report them, and they're usually shallow. Uh, Morrison, for instance, the, the Morrison Formation has a number of dendritic, uh, but they're very shallow. They, they don't even go through the formation itself. So that, uh, uh, your first question, what, what do other geologists say about this? Uh, the one that, on the net, you know, they, they comment about it occasionally, you know, and one of the, I still, I still, one of the common things I've seen several places, is, you know, well, no, these formations, uh, they, uh, they thin out. Well, of course, all formations do this, you know. I, I don't follow the reasoning there, uh, per se, but the one person who's addressed this is Norman New. Uh, he wrote an article about this and so on and on. Uh, and he, he said, I certainly have no simple answer to this question. For the, and he tried to explain it on the basis of these being uh, wide beaches, shorelines, and so on, which would, you know, half of these I showed you are terrestrial, not beach type of deposit. It doesn't answer the question at all. And he admits he, he, he doesn't have a, a good answer for it. And, it's one of those things that uh, problems that we put on the shelf, you know, because we got to find oil, we got to find coal, and the money is uh, uh, where you can uh, get get <laughs> into those areas. But uh, so the question is there, uh, but I don't see a a, uh, a good answer for it in the in the geological literature. Uh, uh, and the fact that they raised the question, like Van Andel, you know, in Venezuela raised the question. Uh, 15 million years, he couldn't find anything. Uh, that quotation, so on. So it's, it's referred to its times, uh, but like, like the erosion rates picture. Uh, so it was in the Vogue. Uh, and, uh, you know, in about half a century ago, and, and people were recognizing, hey, we got a problem here, this is too much. Uh, it's way too fast. We, so on, our continent should be all gone, so on. But then we go on to other things, and uh, geology, like other factors, has its times of fashion. And one of the most interesting things that's occurring to me, you'll understand this more than others here, is that of uh, late, people are starting to raise questions about sequence stratigraphy. And I, uh, I've been suspicious of <laughs> sequence. I really, really, I wonder how long the, the thing would last before uh, uh, questions would be raised. We're having a big conference in England uh, this fall on, on sequence stratigraphy. People are wondering, you know, if it, it involves, you know, certain assumptions, which in their model, are perfectly fair and so on and so on, but man, uh, let's not be tied down to one cycle type of system. Uh, nature is more complex than that. You have a question, yeah. Yeah, I, this is uh, fascinating. It just shows how complex the geologic <coughs> column really is. 
but um, I was um, wondering, you know, when, when we look at these, you're looking for long-term erosional processes that are apparently missing. Uh, so we're looking for something that's not there. What we have to also always account for is what is there. Uh, you see a lot of geologic layers, you know, as you mentioned, they're kilometers thick. <coughs> and um, in, in uh, deep time for those geologic layers, you can have both long processes and short processes. And it doesn't matter, <coughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't take away from the uh, uh, the conclusion that there could be deep time in the geologic mm -hmm. column. But if you're going to try to talk about a flood geology, um, you, uh, in which you have, everything has to have happened within 6,000 years or approximately that long for the whole geologic mm -hmm. column, um, then you can't, then you, you're, you're, you lose your support if there's even one layer in that column that can only be laid down in long periods of time. Right. It's uh, it's it's just like a deductive. Yeah, it's mean, just a, just like a deductive argument. You know, absolutely. You can have a whole bunch <coughs> of premises. If you prove one premise that is logically you, uh, falsifiable, then the whole conclusion is 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 thrown out. If it's worthy of the silver bullet, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, do you <coughs> find any um, layers in the geologic column that can only be laid down? in long periods of time? Or can you, or, or do you have mechanisms in the flood model <laughs> that account for every layer, type of layer, and there's many types of layers there that can be accounted for in uh, a short chronology? Um, I don't know of any layer that, uh, I'm gonna say, hey, this is impossible. This is a silver bullet. Uh, what, what, what about limestone? Uh, because limestone, limestone. Lime, every you got lots of limestone layers there, yeah. and there's no way those could be laid down in a short period of time, because they're they're not they're not sedimentary deposits. They're they're formed by uh, uh, precipitants, Ooh. in which you've got ions <laughs> uh, suspended in a uh, you know in seawater. That if you add uh, silt <clears throat> and and uh, uh, you know, clays and other sediments mm -hmm. in it, it destroys the, 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 the precipitation process. So yeah. every, you've got lots of, you've, you've already, you mentioned a bunch of limestone layers there. Yeah. And air, uh, but there's no one, way one, those layers which <laughs> are there, <coughs> not, we're not looking for something that's not there, yeah. we're looking for, we're seeing something that is there that can only be laid down in a long period of time. So, okay. um, we would not by a flood, yeah. not by a flood mechanism. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, I would I would accept that as a silver bullet if you would state that there was no limestone before the flood. Uh, no lime. In fact, Ellen White talks about clay and lime that God had strewn in the bottom of the ocean were uplifted and thrown hither and thither. Uh, Limestone has obviously been transported. You go into that, uh, we'll talk about that in two weeks. Uh, go into that uh, oh, uh, Moab limestone, for instance. They've got layers there, marker layers, that run for 50 miles. They're only a few feet thick. Yeah, but it just this, thinks this, you. You have no place on earth where you can put that kind of stuff of these fossil or this has obviously been transported. Well, uh, but, but <coughs> that but that doesn't disprove a long period of time. It just means something may have happened quickly in that long period of time. And that's that doesn't dis disprove it. And and don't you need organic processes to produce limestone? Uh, so you can't it can't be really you can't really say it's Precambrian. Oh, well, I think uh, some layers <coughs> are not, or above most the limestone. Most limestone you can't tell where it came from. Yeah. Uh, precipitated, maybe. Fossil, maybe. Uh, you, you look in these limestones, and <coughs> I, had, I did an exercise once. Uh, students, I was taking them down the Grand Canyon. I asked them to estimate, look at the limestone, they estimate the percentage of fossils they found, you know. Most of them came up in the region one or two percent was fossiliferous. 
Now, granted, that is just looking at the coarse fossils. You also got fine fossils that would make that figure bigger, per se. But uh, the, I, I, I have a hard time. I think there was limestone here before the flood, helping in the balance of the ocean, or that type of thing. Uh, uh, that's that's uh, to me perfectly uh, perfectly uh, logical thinking. Yeah, but the deposition rates are not fast enough, even over, over 1,600 or you know whatever time before the flood, to to account for. Well, no, they were part. They were part uh, of the original that creation. That much, what's that? They were part of the original creation to provide uh, so the balance. So they're miraculous. It's a miraculous component. Yes. Okay. Well, God designed the earth to begin with, and there's one other point that I think you're missing. Um, <coughs> it's if I can put it that way, it's a talking point around uh, that all you need is one exception that, that shows that you have, say, over <coughs> 50,000 years. So you trot out the Yellowstone Fossil Forest and suddenly everything collapses. Well, there are two things. One of them is the Yellowstone Fossil Forest as a paradigm for long age has collapsed itself. We're going to be talking about that later. <coughs> but the more important point is this, that if you were to show that there was less than, let's say, 5,000 years between the Cambrian and, uh, say, the Devonian, that means that that entire part of the geologic column was lay, laid down in less than 5,000 years. That destroys the standard geologic time scale. The geologic time scale suffers from the same problem with silver bullets that the creationist one does. It's a mistake to say, well, you could just accommodate it because you see mm -hmm. if you collapse the Cambrian and the Devonian, and then you collapse, <laughs> let's say, the uh, Permian and the Triassic, and then you, and you keep collapsing it like that, eventually you have no time for the time scale. That is, there are silver bullets on the other side, too. Now, as it turns out, they're complex, and it's not easily arguable straight through without taking a lot of time to go through all of the geology. So it's uh, there really isn't a silver bullet in science, as we find out. Uh, but, there, but the problems are not asymmetric. The problems are symmetrical. There is a problem when you have, when, if, if, you could, if you could demonstrate that, let's say, the Carboniferous was less than, um, was less than uh, 40,000 years ago. The entire geologic column up to the, Cam the Carboniferous would collapse, and it would be the same kind of catastrophic collapse as it would be for somebody proving that this layer took uh, <coughs> 500,000 years to, to, to develop. It's not just a, it's not an asymmetric problem. Yeah, it is an asymmetric problem because for a deep time in a geologic column, you can have both long processes and short processes going on. You can't have that same uh, 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 relative ratio uh, with sh uh, short chronologies. I don't think you're thinking straight on this. Well, uh, let me explain. Yeah, yeah, uh, if the Carboniferous <laughs> was less than 50,000 years ago, the geologic column collapses up to the Carboniferous. But uh, as I said, if you find one column there that can only be uh, produced But if you find one column there that could only be produced by short age processes, you have the problem in reverse. No, it just makes it complex. It just, it just <laughs> makes it a complex issue. It doesn't, it doesn't destroy the long period of time. It just, there are lots of things if the that go on. If the carboniferous is less than 50,000 years old, <laughs> then, it, then no amount of arguing is going to change that fact. Well, that may be for that one layer. I'm not trying to, to, to argue uh, against it, the, 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 the geolog standard geologic model. The is below the, uh, the uh, 
Triassic, the, the Permian, the Triassic, the Jurassic, the Cretaceous, all of those come up with it if the Carboniferous goes. I, I understand, <coughs> but it does, that does not, if there's a layer there that can only be produced over long periods of time, it does, it does not destroy, uh, it destroys the short-term chronology. No, you are correct that a silver bullet in one direction would be a problem. Yeah. But you're failing to see that a silver bullet in the other direction would also be a problem. I don't, no, I don't, I don't see it as a problem because uh, oh. there's plenty of geologists that recognize that, that catastrophes wow. happen. Wow. Good. Right? Sure. Plenty of geologists. They're in a time frame that, in a yeah. paradigm where they exclude God. I'm not interested in their conclusions where they exclude God. I want truth in case God exists. Yeah. It, I understand. I want, I'm trying to understand truth as well. But if there's questions like those, I want to try, and I'm just trying to figure them out and trying to get well, a, uni yeah, a uniform Really, we're, we're talking about lead bullets here, okay? <laughs> yes. We're not talking about silver bullets. But okay. We're talking about lead bullets I, on both sides. I, I think what Paul's trying to say is that if you have, find something that is old underneath something you, that you know is new, then what are you say? How did the old thing get there under the new? In other words, somebody you're saying somebody buried it there? No, it I just mean, means it was a short period of time. Something happened in a short period of time before something happened in a long period of time. That's all. But how can okay. the short thing be over the long thing? Why not? Under then, underneath the lava flows happen all the time. Those are short periods. But those of aren't. Events. But you. But if they if you know they're not lava <laughs> flows. Yeah, I, I understand, but I'm, I'm just giving an example that you can have things in the geologic column that happen rapidly, and lava flows are one of those. Yeah. Um, you got to give it some specific place. I don't know if that exists. These paraconformities are found all over the world. You can pretty well, I have not put the all together, you pretty much eliminate the, almost all of the geologic column by different places where they are. You know, here they are, and here are the layers that take the place of the paradigm for and so on. Uh, so you, you, but if it's missing in one place, it's missing everywhere else. Uh, of course, you know, you, but keep in mind, we are dealing here with historical science. And uh, it's not something we can repeat. Uh, the idea, if it's unequivocal, of course, okay, sure. It's, I don't know of any such data. I mean, we can all, uh, because we're dealing with historical science, uh, it's pretty hard to, to uh, find that silver bullet. And, uh, you know, as they say, many scientists live and die without realizing how difficult it is to prove a point. Uh, and it's especially the case when you're dealing with historical science. But when I put this whole picture together, uh, the biblical picture makes more sense. You go out there and look at the geology, there's a lot of data there that's hard to put together if you believe in those long geologic ages. Uh, and then when you add to that the question of the origin of life, and uh, I mean, it, science is, in collapse on that question. Uh, there's got to be a God. If there's a God, he'd communicate with us, I think. He wouldn't leave us without any communication. And the Bible seems to fit. And a lot of genetic data fits the Bible. Yeah, I, you know, but we still have a question. There is deep time in the history, even within the biblical uh, narrative. Sure, absolutely. And, and, and so where's the, where's the dividing line of where life is in, in, in that story. And that's, that's, that's what we're trying to, to, to come up with. We still have the issue of deep time. Uh, and we, we need to find out what, what the boundaries are, what the uh, boundary lines are for those. And that's... Well, that's you're aware that Adventists uh, tend to be more towards deep time for the universe and for the so. matter of the earth. That's a good thing. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, uh, maybe there was an empty earth here before creation week. Maybe. The, uh, uh, as, uh, keep in mind, uh, 
in 1860. This was probably Uriah Smith. The, the article is not signed. He, he raises this very question about, hey, there could have been matter here before uh, creation week. Nothing in the Bible seems to counter that. Uh, F.M. Wilcox, 1898, Adventist Review again, raises the same question. Hey, you know, I've been before. You read Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, sounds like nothing of creation occurs till Genesis 1, verse 3, where God sp starts speaking, and there was light. Uh, it describes an earth there before, which could be. Uh, you go to Psalms, uh, 24.2 speaks of the earth coming out of water. Uh, you go to Psalms 136.6 uh, speaks of the earth uh, coming out of water. You go to Second Peter 3.6 he uh, speaks of the earth created out of water. They, these folks now, but I'll admit you go to Genesis 1.14 it sounds like the sun and the moon were created on the fourth day. So you have a choice here. Uh, the weight of the evidence, I think, is on the side there was something here before. Well, I had a little thing I was going to ask you about. Um, when Warren talked about the um, remnants of rivers, you know, mm -hmm. going under for a mm -hmm. long ways, mm -hmm. um, it kind of reminded me of the stromanolite thing. Uh, stromanolites, you know, they exist around the, the edges of rivers, the edges of um, lakes, freshwater lakes, salty mm -hmm. lakes, whatever. Mm -hmm. And they also, um, they need um, calcium carbonate, you know, they grow. And that mm -hmm. comes from limestone, which is mm -hmm. decayed limestone, isn't it? Because it, th isn't the rain kind of wash it away and then there's a chemical cross process oh, that it makes the... Uh, it can come various ways. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I guess my point is that um, when you see these termanolites that were under mm -hmm. these layers here, it must have took some time for those to grow, even if you say that they grow mm -hmm. rapidly. Mm -hmm. You still have to have the time for those termanolites to grow, and plus they've got to be exposed mm -hmm. to sunlight because, um, you know, they, they yeah. create photosynthesis. Um. One of the experts on stromatolites, and his name slips on my mind, he, he states, one of the things that haunts scientists who are on stromatolites is that they may not be biogenic at all. Uh, you get my point? They're not so biogenic. They're not life, you're saying? They're not life, right. Okay. We, we have a host of pseudo-fossils, especially you're talking about Precambrian fossils. There's a book over here in the Geoscience Library there's 300 Precambrian and Cambrian pseudo fossils. These are fossils that were considered to be fossils, now they've been said to be not fossils. At Stromatolite, you're dealing in a, this is one of those areas where witchcraft and, and geology intersect. <laughs> and you're, you're, uh, it's, um, it, you're not sure for sure what is going on, for instance. Uh, uh, we do have living stromanolites even oh, today. Oh, absolutely. We they are it. different, though. I know that. In Sharks Bay and so on. But when you preserve, you don't preserve the cells in stromatolites. And you don't, you're not sure, was that a sediment that was laid down and bent around? Or is that something that grew? Uh, historical science. Enjoy it. <laughs> okay, I think you folks have a good Sabbath. Let's see. Don't forget to come back next week for John Baumgartner. <laughs>